Thank you very, very much indeed, dear uh, President, dear Rector. I am very, very pleased, very happy to be back at Bocconi University, and uh, I feel very much at home now that uh, I am regularly invited, and I thank you very much for this invitation. I'm very happy to respond positively. Well, I uh, was here two years ago, and uh, I have to say that uh, I'm struck to see how much has changed in the world economy in such a short period of time. My intervention two years ago took place a few months before the collapse of Lehman Brothers, before the, difficult, the political difficulty of the TARP, which marked the peak of the global financial crisis. Back in the spring of 2008, we were keenly aware of the risk ahead, but few could have imagined the proportions of what eventually came to happen in the autumn of the same year. And still, as you might remember, we had been the first central bank to diagnose a real issue which was of a, a very, very dramatic uh, nature as soon as August 2007, when we decided to pour liquidity uh, to the market of the euro area. According to the calculations made by two economists, Barry Ashen Green and Kevin O'Rourke, the initial decline in global production between mid-2008 and mid-2009 was broadly comparable with uh, that has been observed between mid-29 and mid-30 during the Great Depression, while the corresponding correction in global equity prices and global trade volumes were even larger. However, the good news is that the global economy has now turned the corner, also have to say thanks to the unprecedented support measures taken by both central banks all over the world and by executive branches, which have helped to restore confidence. Indeed also, the rebound in equity prices and trade volumes has been very, very substantial. Global financial and economic conditions have improved significantly over 2009, according to the latest projections published by the International Monetary Fund, global output is expected to rise by about 4% this year after a contraction of about half a percent last year. However, the recovery remains fragile in Europe. We expect it to be modest, and we do not exclude a bumpy road ahead of us. I had occasion to say that on the Thursday afternoon. Available indicators suggest that the economic recovery in the euro area is on track, although it is likely to remain uneven. Inflation is expected to remain moderate over the policy-relevant horizon. Activity remains dependent on past support measures to a significant extent. Central banks have started to implement, as you said, Mr. Rector, their gradual exit from non-standard support measures, and it is of paramount importance that government implement rigorously consolidation strategies in the near future. It's one of your four challenges. Above all, we cannot afford to be again in such a dramatic situation at the global level, nor can we expect taxpayers to be ready to put again as much as around 25% of GDP at risk through various options like recapitalization, like uh, uh, guarantee options of all kinds, in order to avert a collapse in the financial sector. And this, which I trust very profoundly, calls for an absolute obligation to make the global financial system more solid and sustainable and the international community is keenly aware, it seems to me, of this need. It is certainly a diagnosis that uh, we very, very widely share in the euro area and in the central bank constituency as a whole. In my remarks today, I will focus on global governance 
and in particular on the lessons that can be drawn from the extraordinary events of the past two years. I will first elaborate on why we need a set of rules, institutions and international relations that we can call global governance. Second, I will analyze how, in hindsight, the existing global governance has fared during the global financial crisis. And finally, I will deal with the evolution of the system as a response to the crisis. And particularly, I will discuss the rise of key new players in the global economy, such as the G20 and the Financial Stability Board. Being in Italy, and I'm being very happy to be in Italy, I have to say, as a cousin germain, I cannot resist mentioning the teachings of Niccolo Machiavelli. He has become known worldwide for his pessimistic and cynical attitude towards power. But in fact, one of his main message was that freedom is not possible without rules. That is, without good institutions. For example, in his Discorsi, he admires the Roman Republic where rules and the respect for law allowed men to be free, in contrast with what we saw with his contemporaries who were, in his eyes, corrupt and unable to stick to rules and therefore needed a tyrant. A famous sentence of his is, and you will forgive my accent, I hope, un principe che può fare ciao che volo e pazzo un popolo che può fare ciò che volo non è savio which I would translate but everybody speaks Italian only for those who couldn't get my accent a prince who can do whatever he wants is mad a people who can do whatever it wants is unwise and I think this is very true, obviously, and uh, the present uh, experience confirmed that. Economic freedom is not possible without an adequate set of rules, and this is valid both, I would say, within countries and at the international level. Let me begin by explaining what we mean by global economic governance and why we need it. By global economic governance, we mean at least in the economic sphere the set of supranational institutions and laws, as well as the international relations between countries that have an effect on cross-border economic and financial transactions. Indeed, no market, even the market in the back street, can survive without an in institutional infrastructure, namely a set of rules, and this is particularly true at the international level where natural barriers to transactions are already formidable. I therefore agree with the late Horst Siebert that one of global governance's primary aims should be that of reducing transaction costs and that the process of doing so is evolutionary and characterized by continuous change and learning by doing. One, therefore, needs to maintain a pragmatic approach with respect to what arrangements may work and not work in facilitating trade and keeping transaction costs low depending on the various circumstances. Moreover, the more complex and durable the goods and services exchanged, the larger the need for a sound institutional infrastructure. In this respect, finance stands out as a field where global rules may be particularly beneficial. More generally, the crisis has weakened the arguments of those who think that deregulation is always and necessarily conducive to a better functioning of markets. We have learned again that markets cannot function properly without a proper regulatory and supervisory infrastructure. <laughs> Of course, there are clear limits to what internationally agreed rules can and should achieve. First, the principle of subsidiarity remains valid, implying that no rule should be imposed at a global level that cannot be more or equally effectively set at the local level. 
Incidentally, this principle is enshrined, as everybody knows, in the Lisbon Treaty as well as in the foundation of European Union. It is part of primary uh, European Union law, and it's explicitly recognized in the Lisbon Treaty. This principle might also imply that the burden of the proof should rest on those who want to establish global as opposed to local rules and institutions. Second, there is a risk that common rules are not optimal and in particular they are too lax since they have to be the common minimum denominator across many different local positions and this is as dangerous as would be the transgression of the subsidiarity rule. Third, some argue that imposing a common rule also implies limiting the range of national experiences and therefore the potential for learning about the best institutional setting. I would therefore prevent the best rules from emerging from free competition amongst different systems. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, it is not easy to set common rules, in particular in very complex and innovative fields like finance. In particular, I agree with the assessment of the former BIS general manager, Andrew Crockett. Uh, he uh, said in a recent speech that to be successful, an international financial architecture has to harness and not run counter to perceived national interests. The global financial crisis has, however, weakened some of these arguments and shattered previously held convictions that putting one's house in order is the only principle that matters to ensure global welfare and that international spillovers need not be taken into account. We have certainly become more aware of the negative externalities that globalization, in particular financial globalization, can create. This is epitomized in the sentence, the crisis is global, the solutions uh, to the crisis need to be global. In my view, international interdependence are too large for purely national or regional roles to be optimal, and there is a clear need to strengthen, and I would say strengthen drastically, global governance, in particular in the financial field. For example, the crisis has exposed the risk of regulatory arbitrage, shedding a more negative light on the competition amongst different systems and rules. In addition, the view that local government are always driven by the welfare of their citizen needs to be really qualified, as special interests often matter a great deal. Those special interests, uh, I have to say, uh, the financial sector comes immediately to mind, are likely to exert less influence if the rules are agreed at the international level. Now let me now turn to analyze how our global institutions have fared during the global financial crisis. Global governance in the decade before the financial crisis was characterized by a number of multilateral institutions and relations, particularly between the key supranational institutions, namely the IMF, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization. Uh, I have to say that uh, uh, I have a vivid memory that without the input of uh, an informal grouping on top of this formal institutional organization, uh, it, that is the, the G7, uh, a lot of uh, progress would have been impossible in the domain of uh, appropriate uh, progress in global governance. Uh, uh, the meeting uh, of the G7 in Halifax, for instance, in June 95, permit to have the core principles of the Basel Committee that were really impossible before. 
Another distinctive feature of the decade before the financial crisis has been a progressively and largely beneficial trade liberalization and integration driven by the WTO. Trade liberalization has clearly reshaped the world economy, leading to the full integration of key emerging economies such as China and India in a market-based system, a trend which has benefited consumers the world over. At the peak of the crisis, there was a legitimate concern that such progresses could be or would be stalled or reversed as countries focused on their own economic growth even at the expense of growth in other countries and at a global level. Protectionist and beggar thy neighbor policies would have certainly aggravated the crisis as they notoriously did in the 30s and yet somehow it could have been accepted in such dire circumstances and also given the political difficulties that were associated with them. A good system is one where the, these self-defeating pressures could be resisted. How have we resisted at the global level uh, in this regard? I would like to look at uh, several dimensions in order to try to make a judgment on this multidimensional issue. I will look at uh, protectionism, at central bank cooperation, at uh, re regulatory arbitrage, and also global imbalances. As regards protectionism, I would say that uh, according to the WTO, a significant outbreak of trade protectionism has been avoided since the start of the crisis. The new trade restricting or distorting measures introduced between October 08 and October 09 accounted together, according to the WTO, for 0.8% of world imports, while those adopted between September 09 and February 10 amounted to an additional 0.4% of world imports. Yet, I have to say, uh, more protectionist measures can be still in the pipeline. Evidence from surveys shows that public pressure for more economic protection not only has been mounting since the mid-2000s, uh, namely well ahead of the crisis itself, but uh, has also intensified, not surprisingly, since the start of the crisis. Second, the Global Trade Alert, an initiative of a network of uh, five independent research institutes across the world reports that 390 trade damaging state measures were announced by G20 members in the 14 month from November 08 to December 09. Over the same period, the uh, G20 passed only 56 measures that benefited importers. So it gives an idea of the dimension of uh, the asymmetry, if I may, in the measures. But all that taken into account, this leads me to conclude provisionally that in the trade field, while a repetition of the experience of the 30s is very fortunately not in the cards, there is certainly no room for complacency and vigilance need to remain high and this is not only the position of the ECB but certainly the position of the central bank constituency all over the world. As regards central bank cooperation which is another dimension of international cooperation that has worked well during the financial crisis I would say that uh, uh, there has been uh, a lot of uh, initiatives that uh, took place and uh, information sharing among central banks uh, has worked very well, uh, particularly, I have to say, in the occasion of our meeting uh, under the auspices of the, international, uh, the, the Bank for International Settlements uh, and particularly in the occasion 
of the global economy meetings that are held every two months in Basel and where uh, central bank governors from systemic economies have the occasion to discuss the situation. I would very much like in this domain to point out that the BIS as an institution has been ahead of the curve in terms of identifying unsustainable trends in the financial sector and more generally in the global economy, such as the underappreciation of risk and excessive credit growth, which eventually led to the global financial crisis. I have to mention that I am in a university. I'm speaking in front of uh, academics uh, and uh, have to say that uh, uh, when you can see that there is a significant difference in the lucidity of the analysis that we are made by various institutions, it is something that has to be mentioned. I have to say in my eyes, and uh, I think it's really something which is quite clear, the BIS was the institution that had quite clearly uh, made a diagnosis on the crises that were uh, prepared uh, at uh, that time. And uh, again, I think that uh, due credit uh, has to be given to the institution. And I have to say that another dimension is certainly the dimension of uh, this regulatory arbitrage and global imbalances. And I have to say that uh, uh, we should not remain obli oblivious to the fact that there were significant shortcomings that have contributed to, the, uh, to create the conditions for the crisis. Uh, I will mention in particular again the uh, fact that we had a lack of sufficient integration and coordination before the crisis in the financial regulation. Uh, we had the, the fact that uh, while finance was becoming more and more global and uh, was coming, becoming more and more global for uh, reasons that are extremely uh, multidimensional themselves uh, associated with the technological progress, particularly in IT, and the opening up of all economies of the world progressively to market economies, at the same time we had financial institutions having operations in dozens of different jurisdictions. Financial regulation remained very, very largely national with only some form of mild and in some cases non-binding coordination of, at the European and international level. And this, of course, is something which uh, played a very important role in creating an environment that had been conducive to the crisis. Uh, as regards the global imbalances, they have also to be mentioned as one of the dimensions of uh, the state of the global situation before the crisis. The insufficient orientation of macroeconomic policies towards the medium term, towards sustainability and sustainability, led, as we all know, to the build-up of unsustainable external imbalances amongst, the, uh, I would say, uh, uh, the world. And uh, these imbalances, external imbalances, were only, of course, reflecting domestic imbalances. So it is. Uh, widely held, I know that it is not totally uncontroversial, but it is a widely held opinion that uh, we had in particular a phenomenon of excessive reserve accumulation by emerging countries that might have made the global deficits uh, of others, of the deficits of others, uh, too easy to finance. But I would say in this respect, it's absolutely clear that, uh, as I said, there was both in the deficit countries and in the surplus countries an absence of sufficient medium long-term consideration. And this is clearly one of the major issues for today. There was a distinct perception of a lack of an effective mechanism to influence 
macroeconomic and structural policies in key systemic countries and economies. And uh, at uh, uh, this stage, I would say that the global public good of international financial stability was dramatically undersupplied. Let me say a, a word also on the question of how the financial crisis has moved the direction of the speed at which uh, the direction and the speed at which global governance is moving. Some of these trends are not necessarily totally clear nor free of uh, further challenges. But there are very clear trends, I have to say. Uh, I note in particular that a distinctive feature of this crisis has been that it originated at the center of the system, differently from past many major crises in the previous three decades. Uh, I was myself, uh, as you said, uh, Mr. Rector, very closely associated with the crisis of the sovereign risk in the 80s and part of the 90s. Uh, I have uh, direct experience of uh, the Asian crisis. Uh, all major crises we had to cope with at a global level were not at the heart of the financial system, not at the heart of the industrialized world, but more or less at the periphery. And when we had a problem at the heart, it was relatively easily absorbed uh, by uh, the uh, system, the financial system in particular, and the economy that were at the core of the global economy. Uh, the fact that this crisis was born at the heart of the system uh, has not surprisingly draw the uh, uh, global international community to change quite profoundly the qualification of the prime group for exchange of views uh, with a view of organizing global governance, I would say informal global governance. I'm speaking of the transition from the G7 to the G20. And uh, uh, I have to say that this is something which I would mention as a major, major change in global governance which took place under our own eyes. We, of course, recognized that uh, the emerging world has to be associated to global governance. And as you know, the G20 was created in the occasion of the Asian crisis. But it was not the prime group for global governance. It was at the time an association, a close association, of the emerging world because the emerging world appeared to be itself systemic. The fact that it is now the G20, which is the main forum for international economic cooperation, is also due to the fact that the industrialized world appears to be clumsy in its own prime handling of the global economy. And I have to say that uh, it is extremely important <coughs> to note that this transition, which might appear natural because it was prepared in the occasion of the Asian crisis, is again, in my opinion, a major, major change in global governance. Uh, as you know, uh, as at the level of the G20, we have, uh, I would say, two sides of the coin of global governance, which are very, very important. One is the organization of a level playing field at a global level, the organization of uh, uh, rules, regulations, prudentials that would be uh, discussed, elaborated, and uh, decided uh, largely by consensus at a global level. Uh, and this is, uh, of course, uh, something which is of extreme importance, and we participate very actively to that. I will come back to that at the level of the central banks. But we have also <coughs> a 
very, very important side of the coin of the G20, which is to organize surveillance, peer surveillance, at a global level uh, between those economies that are deemed to be systemic with the help of the, of the IMF. And uh, uh, I have to say that this means a lot in terms of, uh, of responsibility, global responsibility of this peer surveillance enlightened by the IMF. This new framework, which is of course extremely bold in terms of global surveillance, had a predecessor, you might remember, that uh, uh, we had uh, started in 2007 a multilateral surveillance initiative. Uh, I have also to say that uh, this multi-surveillance initiative did a good job in terms of diagnosis and appeared uh, quite uh, ineffective in obtaining real changes in the macro policies of those, who, those very few that participated in the multilateral surveillance initiative. So now that uh, we have the G20 and the framework for multilateral surveillance at the level of the G20, it is, I have to say, of paramount importance in my eyes that the international community presses ahead now and fully lives up to the commitment taken in the G20 context. In particular, it is very important that efforts are maintained even as the main, uh, the most acute uh, episode of the global financial crisis appears progressively to be behind us. It is true in this domain. It is true in all domains. I would say also a word on the further strengthening of central bank cooperation. In the area of central bank cooperation, discrete but decisive steps have been made since the onset of the crisis. A core feature of this crisis has been not only the central importance of domestic liquidity provision by central banks, but also its complementary cross-border dimension, that is the network of temporary currency swaps or repos set up bilaterally by major central banks such as the ECB and the Federal Reserve, which has involved many other central banks in the world. At the same time, progress has been also made in deepening central bank cooperation and extending its uh, reach. The main forum uh, of global central bank cooperation is the Global Economy Meeting, which takes place in Basel. Over the past few years, this forum has been including 34 governors as permanent members, plus a member of other governors attending uh, on a revolving basis. This global economy meeting is an important forum as it assesses global and financial conditions, analyzes economic and financial policy issues of common interest, to central banks and provides guidance for the central bank cooperative activity conducted by various Basel-based central bank committees under the auspices of the BIS. It is remarkable that the global economy meeting has now replaced the G10 grouping of central bank governors as the prime forum for the governance of cooperation among central banks. We have now a fully extensive global ownership of the governance of this cooperation extending to systemic emerging economies. And I have to say that it is also remarkable that this global ownership even goes significantly beyond the borders of the G20 membership. I have the privilege to chair presently the global economy meeting and I have to say that I find the frank and very rich discussion we hold at these bi-monthly meetings of unvaluable importance for the central bank community at large. Let me also, uh, uh, to uh, be complete, in the changes that uh, we have engineered at the level of global governance, let me turn to the 
uh, Financial Stability Board, which is another crucial innovation of the past couple of years. Uh, we had created, exactly like the G20, we had created the Financial Stability Forum in the time of the Asian crisis to respond to the challenges we had in the Asian crisis. Stemmed by the present difficulty, the present crisis, we have extended the uh, membership and the range of comp comp competences of the Financial Stability Forum, which is now, because of this extension, called Financial Stability Board. You know that the FSB is chaired by Mario Draghi and uh, is in charge, together with the IMF, of strengthening the international financial architecture and in charge of global financial stability. The expanded membership now largely overlaps with the G20 and the stronger mandate significantly raises the profile of the FSB. The broad membership of the FSB where you have the central banks, regulatory authorities together with treasuries ensures an unprecedented degree of international cooperation in regulatory matters. The FSB has been working actively on drawing the lessons from the crisis from the standpoint of the global principles for prudential rules, regulations and supervision of all financial activities. In any case, progress is building a, a global financial regulation architecture that is broadly agreed and at the same time effective. We need, I have to say, a very consistent and strong and determined action of all parties involved to work in the direction that had been identified. One has to fully understand that in this domain we are necessarily cooperating voluntarily and uh, you have to reach a consensus and then apply the result of the consensus at the level of the various nations or economies concerned. Let me now say just a word to be sure that uh, I am comprehensive on uh, the IMF and then I will sum up and uh, propose to you some reflection as a conclusion of this exposition. Uh, the evolution of global governance uh, has also called for reform of the, reform of the Bretton Woods institution themselves, in particular, of course, the IMF. Also, in this case, this is a question that was already present in everybody's mind before the crisis, but which has become more pressing during and after it, in particular, the reform of the quota and voice at the IMF, which is ongoing, should foster its legitimacy and inclusiveness, improving overall global governance in line with the decision of transferring competences and responsibilities from the G7 to the G20. An important byproduct of the crisis has been the realization that the IMF lending capacity should be bolstered after years of progressive decline in the IMF lending activities. Also, the IMF will need to refocus in activity, its activity towards monitoring the international financial system and the threats to global financial stability, drawing from uh, its uh, strengthen analytical capabilities. A very important step in this direction, uh, and I have already mentioned the cooperation between the FSB and the IMF, is the implementation of the joint IMF-FSB early warning exercise, which is aimed at strengthening the assessment of systemic, low probability, high impact risks to the global economy and identifying possible mitigating actions. To sum up, overall, the system is moving decisively towards an ownership of global governance that is really inclusive and comprehends systemic emerging economies as well as industrialized economies. 
this very significant transformation of global governance that we are engineering today can be illustrated strikingly by the three major examples I just expanded upon. First, the G20 replaces the G7 as the prime group for global economic and financial governance at the level of ministers and governors and at the level of heads. Second, the global economy meeting of central bank governors replaces the G10 group of governors as the prime group for the governance of central bank corporation. And third, the financial stability board membership is extended far beyond the borders of the G7, which were its initial borders at, the, at its inception. Not surprisingly, after a global financial crisis, the economic and financial sectors are areas where a new concept of global governance has been decided. And uh, I expect, of course, that this new global governance, which is in the making, will have a number of tests uh, over the period and the years to come. I said that I would, in conclusion, mention a few points. Let's say that I will mention three points. We are living in times which we will remember for long, a very defining, very important, very defining moment. As I said, it was the worst crisis in World War, World War II, and it could have been the worst crisis since World War I, had we not taken very bold and rapid measures at the level of central banks and at the level of governments, of executive branches. And uh, I have to say that the global financial crisis has shattered the world and changed our beliefs, but I trust that we can still harness it for the better and live in a more integrated and stable, both integrated and stable world. If I were, again, to uh, summarize the key lessons of the global financial crisis and uh, the key challenges also that uh, are in front of us, I would say that uh, first, we have experienced over the last perhaps 30 years a very profound transformation of economy and finance at the level of the planet. The combination of a technological revolution, which is still ongoing and perhaps accelerating, uh, particularly, but not exclusively, in the field of information technology. And I, I really trust that what we are observing today is unprecedented in terms of advances of science and technology on a very large front. It has undoubtedly contributed, particularly the IT revolution, to create a new entity, which is the globally integrated economy. I would say also that the fact that we have observed the fall of the Soviet Empire during this period of 30 years and that we have observed the generalization of market economy at a global level with the conversion of uh, uh, so-called centralized economy in the third world uh, to market economy has created, contributed to create this new entity, which is, again, a globally integrated economy with the associated global financial system. We have attained a degree of intertwining and interdependencies at the global level, which was previously absolutely unseen in terms of intensity of the links and also in terms of rapidity of the global transmission of shocks. I was myself associated with the crisis of the 80s, the crisis of the 90s. I had never observed a crisis where a single event at a certain place in the world, on a single institution, for instance, would be channeled 
to the entire world in terms of uh, all economies of the world, whether industrialized or emerging, and all sectors of the economies of the world, whether financial or non-financial. This, per se, is something which, again, was unseen. But what was even more surprising and unseen was that this transmission of the shock was taking only a few half days, only a few half days to transmit at a global level a shock uh, which uh, was extremely well identified in terms of uh, institution concerned and date. It was a premiere in the history of economy and finance and in a way it's the best illustration I, I have to confirm that we really have a new entity, which is the fully globalized economy. Uh, second, we have the fact that the pertinent economic and financial entity, which is global and calls for appropriate concept of global governance, uh, is not disputed now by anybody. I have already expanded on that, on the fact that uh, we had transformed the uh, rich of global governance, and it's clear that very bold changes that were still appearing unrealistic before 2008 have been, I would say, spontaneously and naturally triggered by the intensification of the crisis in mid-September 2008. I would say that uh, it is absolutely imperative that all institutions governments, central banks, and parties concerned do all what they can to make the new constellation of global governance work exemplary, what was natural and largely spontaneous in the time where we were at the heat of the crisis, must be maintained, of course, when we are in more normal times, because we still have in front of us this new entity which is global. And thirdly, I would say that the central issue, mainly for executive branches and for the political leadership, is that even if the pertinent entity is the global economy and global finance, major decisions have to be taken at the level of individual countries. Only to speak of the industrialized world it is necessary to make our public opinion sufficiently aware of the externalities of national decisions and consequently on the necessity to internalize complex concepts like global economic prosperity, like global financial stability. In our democracies, and very fortunately of course, decisions depend on the sentiment of the people. I consider that one of the most formidable challenges of today is to optimize tireless explanations to our own public opinion of the very nature of the new globalized world in which we are all living now. And I have to say, speaking in Bocconi University, that academia has a very, very important role to play in this domain, in my sentiment. I would thank you very much for your attention.